Maraming salamat, uh, Sir June, and uh, pleasant good afternoon to my esteemed uh, advisor committee and of course the, the guests and friends. All right, uh, I'm here to present uh, my dissertation proposal, which is entitled uh, The Correlates of Bat and Water Species Richness and Abundance in Palio Island, uh, Philippines. All right, so first off, uh, I'm here to tell you about the different uh, rec recognized zones inside the cave, depending on uh, depending on the conditions on environment and biotic uh, conditions. So first we have the entrance zone. So we have the entrance zone, so we have uh, constant uh, sunlight, variable temperature, and there's, uh, for the most part, a green vegetation. Then when you go inside or further into the interior of the cave, so what we call now is twilight zone, and there is less light. Of course, uh, uh, sunlight can still penetrate, but uh, the degree is not that um, um, heavy. And Oh, sorry. There are minor temperature changes, so relatively stable, and of course, w when the sun reaches uh, some parts of the twilight zone, there are still minimal plant life. And then when you go further, further inside the cave, so you now have the dark zone. There's still no light, uh, in perpetual darkness, and of course, there's this constant, uh, uh, relatively stable temperature. Right, so what about productivity in the cave? There are various sources of energy that can come into a cave. And some of these are, well, from sunlight, uh, a limited, um, limited amount of sunlight, and of course the plants. So you have inorganic compounds in which type of other crops can, can, can actually process these as uh, for energy. And you also have uh, water uh, in various forms, drips, um, streams, and even moisture, particularly along, uh, on walls. And animal matter and derivatives, such as, for example, this carcass of rodent that, uh, that happens to be inside a cave, or, or accidentally uh, went inside a cave. Uh, despite all this, this, this sweep of, of, of energy source that can come into a cave, it's still usually considered oligotropic. Uh, there's a relatively low um, amount of, of productivity inside, except when there's hyperaccumulation of resource subsidies. And these kind of resource subsidies can be provided by, by bats in the form of, of guano, right? And when you look here into this, uh, inside the cave, where you have bat guano as a resource base, so you, it gives rise to a, a network of complicated um, trophic interactions. And most of these are uh, interactions with, trophic interactions with insects or arthropods. So you have recreative wars, uh, fungi, or even directly from, from insects. And then you also have um, secondary, primary, secondary, and even up to tertiary consumers. So in some ways, the, 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 the nodes inside of food chain um, usually is um, quite um, engaging, complicated. Right? So there are many nodes, and of course, there are many links. And, if, and, and in some instances, it can also extend outside of the cave environment itself. So let's say other threshold, usually at the entrance, or sometimes when it's near body of water or stream, or even along uh, along the coast near near the sea. So the, the the food chain, food chain, or the tropic interaction can extend to these external environments. And uh, looking at this uh, very close to link, intimate relationship between the bats and the arthropods, and in between the, uh, you have the guano that can act as an intermediary. So this gave me some sense of a, a eureka moment on how to do about my dissertation. So I'm, I want to look at how this, uh, an environment, an ecosystem inside cave works. Right, which gives rise to my main question. My main question for this dissertation is, what are the factors, uh, what are the factors that influence species richness and abundance for both bats and arthropods inside a cave ecosystem. And I also have uh, at least three specific questions. First, is, first of all is, how do cave structure um, relating to cave architecture, and then you have environmental conditions such as microclimate, and biological traits. Biological traits of the bats, uh, depending on, uh, does, it, does it have a high species richness, high abundance, um, influence. How does the, yeah, how the, how do they influence the species richness and abundance patterns of these bats and arthropods? And for my second specific question is, uh, does bat species richness and abundance affect or mediate in turn 
the abundance and, uh, and sweet riches of arthropods themselves. Do they mitigate, uh, do, do, do bats perform uh, a facilitating role in promoting or mediating uh, arthropod abundance and sweet riches? And my third question is, is it a commensurate effect? Is there a one-to-one -one correspondence? So if you have a high diversity of bats, high abundance of bats, does it correspond to high diversity of arthropods? diversity and abundance. And when you have low at the, at the other end of the spectrum, you have, when you have low diversity of batch, low abundance, does it also translates to low diversity and abundance of, of arthropods? Yeah. So for the last two or three years, I, I scoured the, the, the literature, the literature uh, printed and, 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 uh, and the internet, of course. I, I scoured the literature for relevant studies. And I'm going to present you for uh, the next 10 or 10 or 12 slides some of the relevant literature, some, some important literature that uh, has relevance to my, my topic. So first is that um, all over the world, um, South Africa, Africa, South America, and even in Asia, there are uh, guano from bats are host or produces or host to a mere number of arthropod species. So let's say in South America there are 124 families. So family level, and so in Africa, 92 families, and in Asia, so there are 101 families that can host, that can uh, uh, have distributions inside the key. And there is wide consensus, there's wide consensus that bats are keystone species in, in, in an ecosystem. So there are several studies that support this. Uh, even, uh, uh, even a textbook example, of a keystone species, actually. Well, uh, you have your uh, a book by Aldemaro Romero, uh, Cave Biology, Life in Darkness, and you also have uh, another textbook by, by David Culver and Tangen Tipan. So I think this is the, these two are the, the textbooks that we use in Cave Biology by 154. Uh, so, so bats are at this, a keystone species. They're uh, widely accessible to that consensus. And and if you look into the guano composition, uh, there's actually uh, there's variation in the guano composition depending on what kind of bat uh, you have inside a cave. So for 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 this paper by Emerson and Roark, uh, so you have frugivorous bats and gibbous, meaning uh, blood sucking bats. But they also have insectivorous bats. And the, the guano that, that are produced by these kinds of uh, bat gills actually have differing. Um, ratio of elements, like for example, carbon to nitrogen ratio, nitrogen to phosphorus, and then you also have carbon to phosphorus. So there's varying significant uh, differences between these kinds of uh, elemental ratio. And from the abstract, so the, the, the variation in that composition, the elemental composition by, provided by different bat gills would actually affect ecosystem structure and dynamics differently. So in, in some ways, the, the paper would, will say that you have this kind of bat guano, you probably have a different suite of arthropods or, or, or organisms that live inside because of the, the difference in the uh, uh, racial elements. And then looking into correlates, so we're now zoning in on my, my, my main topic, so arthropod species richness and abundance correlates in case. So this was done by Rodrigo Ferreira. At, uh, so uh, Rodrigo Ferreira is, a, uh, is an authority in, in uh, neotropic caves, uh, and he used several um, cave attributes. So one example would be distance from cave entrance, and he compared it with oh, sorry, sorry, diversity or uh, Shannon. So apparently, uh, what 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 this data will say that the maximum diversity would be at a medium distance from the entrance, and then. Looking at uh, another graph that they, they, they made, so he correlated species richness with the pH of the guano file. So there's an added level here. So Panina, uh, a while ago, I showed that uh, the, the guano composition differed by the, the racial elements, and here we have pH, and it seems that maximum diversity, or at least a uh, high diversity, would be seen at the pH that is below uh, more of an acidic, mild acidic uh, soils. And then, for, uh, and then of course, a paper uh, that was done in, in Bracken Cave in, in Texas, uh, looking into guano subsidy and invertebrate community, uh, 
the results will show that there would be more uh, significantly more arthropods in the top layer of the guano as compared to the bottom, looking here at the graph, and within the cave, cave zones themselves. So zone one would actually correspond to the entrance zone. Oops. Zone two is the twilight, and zone three is the dark zone. So both ends of the cave, from the dark zone and the, the, the entrance zone, would have significantly higher uh, arthropod diversity when you compared it with, with uh, the intermediate or the twilight zone. Okay, and then looking at cave attributes as drivers of guanobine diversity. So for this paper by Simoes et al., so they used five physical uh, cave uh, attributes and uh, look into the relationship with invertebrate species in 55 cave. So, uh, before uh, the, the, the studies that I've shown you before, uh, we would only focus on single cave division. So this now is on 55 caves. And the results would show that more, invert, uh, more uh, there's a positive linear uh, correlation between total richness and entrance size or entrance width. There's also more species that are found in complex caves as shown here with this linear development. And in terms of water bodies, so uh, more species are found in streams compared to puddles or in caves with, with dry substrate. Okay, what about bats? Uh, so I'm zoning in on, on Philippine, Philippine bats, so Philippine cave bats. So there's a paper by Jody, Jody Sella in 2014, where she surveyed the, bat, the cave bats in and this is in Bohol, in Bohol in 2014. And the 29, out of the 29 known species that are found in Bohol, 19 of them are cave dwelling, which represents two thirds <coughs> of the bat fauna for the island. And uh, my survey in Marinduque Island in, in 2015, uh, almost similar percentage, 16 out of the 24 total bats in, in, in Marinduque are cave dwelling as well. So, so what I realize here is that when you survey bats in, in islands, uh, it would do you, it would be very, very worthwhile to survey caves. Because uh, and more, uh, the, the, the probability of, of detecting more species would be higher if you, if you added uh, surveys inside the cave, rather than just focusing on other types of types like forest or, or, or what have you. And, <coughs> This paper in 2001, uh, it's published in Journal of uh, Mammalogy by, by um, Anya Brunet and Rodrigo Medellin. Uh, they treated caves as islands, mm -hmm. and as such, they actually tried to apply the species area relationship in caves. So in species area where, where there, uh, the, there are higher species when you have a higher area or a larger area, and there is actually positive, direct positive and significant correlation between number of species and surface area of cave. So which means that the higher, the, the larger the cave, you would have expected a larger number of, <coughs> higher number, uh, higher diversity of bats. And in China, uh, this, so this was published in 2007, so distribution of underground habitats of cave dwelling bats. So, Aside from looking into different uh, of variables, uh, so you have here height, chamber, width, length, and then entrance. So they also try to look into each species distribution or each species preference. So looking into, into this canonical distribution uh, well, or ordination diagram, it seems that more species, some of these uh, more species would actually prefer, based on the number of cases that is surveyed, would actually prefer cases that are high, Caves that have more chambers, caves that are wide, and caves that have uh, uh, that are long. So, and then for some caves, uh, for some bats, they would prefer a, a, a higher uh, number of entrances. Right. So this one is in, uh, was done in the Philippines by Kendra, Kendra Phelps, and uh, Tega Pinkston, her, her supervisor. So. She, she uh, gathered several uh, cave attributes, several uh, multiple, multiple variables, and she found out that surface level disturbance, PC1, and cave complexity, PC2, shown here, 
with straight uh, solid line would be the most influential variables to Bernie's species assemblage. Mm -hmm. So other uh, uh, other component, uh, so we should, uh, this one would pertain, I think, to bat hunting, some would pertain to mining. Uh, but nonetheless, the, the, the most influential variables would be the disturbance at the surface or at the landscape and cave complexity. So looking into this um, uh, literature, and of course, not in the uh, number, so these are the major uh, significant. Uh, looking into the, to the literature and analyzing it a bit, bit I see some research gaps, uh, which actually would provide me with a niche actually on how to contribute to cave bio bio biology or cave science. For bats, uh, despite the number of articles, papers that I've shown you, there are very few studies worldwide. Uh, apparently, this is not a very famous uh, area of research. So, looking into correlates of bats and arthropods, it's not a very uh, famous research. And before 2016, less than five var variables were only considered. So, it's not a multiple, uh, multi-variate approach. And only one paper uh, was done on analysis of uh, uh, several uh, uh, variables ranging up to, uh, reaching up to 20 or 15 variables at least. And for all, for arthropods, almost all col colorations, correlation studies were done on a single cave location. And usually uh, what they did was looking into the, the attribute inside, just inside the cave, so in distance from the entrance, uh, pH, uh, what have you. And then, similar to bats, less than five variables were considered, and there's only one large scale study that was done. So this was in Brazil in, by Simoes. And for bat arthropod dynamics in caves, so I'm now uh, closely, slowly inching into my, to my, to my, uh, to my chapters. So, so from the literature, so you have high bat uh, when you have high species richness and high abundance of bats, this would translate to a high number of guano in terms of depth, okay? You have larger area for, for guano, and then the composition, because you have different bat yields. So you have insectivorous bats, you have frugivorous bats, you have sangivorous bats. And uh, the studies would show that that kind of characteristic of the guano would translate to a high number of arthropods in terms of species richness and abundance. But unfortunately, what about at the other end of the spectrum and in between? So when you have no bats, so if you have no bats, of course there will be no guano. What happens to the arthropod bats? So we have yeah, moderate, moderate species richness. What, uh, what happens to the arthropods as well? So in some ways, uh, this would be the, 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 the crux, the, the crux of, of my, my, my dissertation. Okay. Um, I said earlier that I plan to do my dissertation in, in Polio Island. So what have I done before uh, for, for, for bad, 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 uh, bad studies there? Um, in, two, in, two, uh, in 2010, uh, in, in May and June, I uh, visited the island and we did a survey there of caves there. So we surveyed, uh, we visited 22 caves and we recorded a total of 16 species of bats. Uh, Virtually all of our cave sites were in the eastern seaboard of the island because of the peculiarities of the geologic, uh, geologic origin of the island. Most of the karst formations are on the eastern side, whereas on the western side is mostly volcanic. And uh, because I've done um, correlation studies on small mammals, these are four rodents, and uh, uh, on a limited scope on, on bats as well, but these are on mountains. So we did some uh, some publications on that together with with Larry Heaney, uh, uh, the late Danilo Valete. So I'm um, uh, going to get data. So I I, I I collected information on land entrance size, temperature, humidity, surrounding vegetation, and then I found out uh, from these 22 cases with their respective uh, number of species of bats, I found that uh, like supports other studies that. There's positive and high R value for cave land and species richness. Same with entrance science. And then there's 
a negative slope or a contrasting uh, relationship between uh, temperature and species richness, whereas for humidity, so there's not a strong uh, relationship and the p-value is just not significant. But of course, I only had a very limited number of caves and we only spent uh, around what, 10 to 15 days there. So this gave, uh, in some ways, this gave me another uh, eureka moment or a Newton's apple moment on how to go about my, my, my PhD work. So now I'm going to uh, show you my proposed uh, objectives and chapters. So the general objective, so essentially, uh, I showed you before my, 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 my main questions and the specific questions. So I tailor made my objectives, in well, effect, of course, my chapters, to those uh, main questions and specific questions that I presented before. And here, my general objective would be to identify possible drivers that can shape bat and arthropods in richness in cave ecosystems. And uh, in consultation with my, 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 my uh, chairman of that, my advisory committee, Dr. Jim Litt, uh, we agreed on three main chapters. First chapter is correlates of bat species richness and abundance. Second is the same, but with arthropod species. And on third, uh, my third chapter, uh, because of the several studies that would uh, tell that bats are keystones in the cave system, I want to investigate if bats, uh, how bats can act as drivers of arthropod trophic and community structure inside the cave. So I have three main chapters, and of course each of those chapters are composed of specific objectives. So medyo pero ano to medyo wordy. So for my specific objective in chapter one, so first I will do another round of survey another round of survey for the island. And here I will add, uh, from the 22 cases that I've surveyed before, I will add twice the number. So I plan to reach about 40 to 50 cases uh, for my thesis. And second would be to identify the factors that would influence uh, in shaping bat species richness and abundance. And here I will zone in on each bat species and determine which of the attributes of the cave would have a significant influence on each of the, the bat species. So for example, I recorded 16 bat species before. There are probably more if I did another round of survey. So for each of those 16 or more species, I will try to look into the habitat or cave habitat preference. So what are the, 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 the attributes that would have significant influence on their, on their distribution? So for my second chapter, so this is on arthropod species richness. It's essentially the same with the first chapter, it's essentially the same with the first chapter, uh, but I'm going to, for specific objective three, I'm going to, to, to widen, which are going to generalize the, the approach. So for bats, it's on species level, but for arthropods, it's going to be on the order level. I'm not sure if I can do that on the family level, but uh, we will see how it goes. And then for number three, cha third chapter, so bats as drivers of arthropod profits and community structure. So I will now determine the patterns of species richness and abundance in arthropods found in caves of varying bat diversity and abundance. So you have, let's say, 40 to 50 caves with uh, different, num uh, different species richness and abundance of bats. So we have 40 of those. I'll try to look what is the or the response of the arthropod community or the arthropod diversity for each of those cases. And my second objective is to generate uh, food web diagrams uh, for each case based on known trophic associations and foraging habits. <coughs> right, so for my conceptual framework, uh, so this is color coded, and but uh, what you have is, um, Look, here is the, the bats, the guano, and the arthropod. So, so like I showed uh, earlier, so you have bats, you have several traits, these richness, abundance, assemblage. For guano, you have quantity and quality. Arthropods, you have well, similar with bats. So when you have high species richness or high of, of these traits, 
you also would have a corresponding high <coughs> rates of the guano. And then, uh, consequently, you also have you know, high arthropod restrictions, abundance, and assemblage. For low, you would have low as well for guano, low content. And then, you would also have low arthropod species richness. But for those that have low species richness and high abundance, as uh, designated here by gray, so it can have high quantity and quality of guano. And, but on the other hand, we don't know what will be the effect on the arthropods. And then you also have the cave attributes. So how does cave attributes come into play? So it can either be favorable or unfavorable. It can have a direct, uh, they have a direct influence on the bats. They also have a direct influence on the arthropods. So, so, so just following the, the colors, so favorable, of course, high, 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 then unfavorable, low, low, and then low. But what about cave attributes can also act on the, the guano itself. For example, disturbances. So if there's high degree of mining, guano mining, high degree of phosphate mining, uh, you would also have a, 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 an effect on the guano tree itself, but you don't know, but uh, as far as uh, uh, literature is concerned, we don't know what's the effect on the quality or the quantity, and of course, what's the effect on the arthropods. Right, uh, chapter method, so here it will be based on the specific objectives. Uh, of my per chapter. So for chapter one, so the scope would be you know, species richness, cave attributes, and distribution per bat species. So I'm going to do, like I said before, I'm going to do a bat sampling for 40 to 50 Ks, and preferably I would like to confine it during the summer months. So Polilio is within the type two climate, so it's rain and rainy season. So, but normally the, the, the highest uh, concentration of rain would be during the months of October to, to February. So I will try to do my, 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 my sampling during the months of March up to August or even up to September when there's relatively less rain. So that's about seven, six to seven months. And I'll do, of course, mist netting and acoustic recording using uh, uh, the back detector. And I'll be recording several bat rates like age, uh, sex, reproductive condition. And then I'll do a species effort curve for uh, each of the case to, to gauge or assess uh, sampling adequacy. And I'll do ecological indices. Uh, for example, Shannon, I'll do, I'll do dominance, I'll do evenness, uh, and what have you. And then, oops, sorry. And then for cave attributes, uh, first I will do cave mapping. Uh, cave mapping is, is uh, uh, part of the exercise in Biobiology 154, cave ecology, and I'm actually uh, teaching that, that part of the, 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 the laboratory class. So for cave mapping, I will determine structural complexity and of course the microclimate conditions. So for example, here, so to start, usually when you do a cave mapping, you start at the entrance, you designate it as station, like station zero, and then when you try to reach the end of the, 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 the cave, so you have so and so number of stations. And for, for those stations, you can, I, I, I will try to put in uh, temperature or, or climate loggers, so you can measure uh, uh, relative humidity, temperature, uh, wind speed, barometric pressure. And then I will also, since it's a measurement, some, some mapping exercise, some measurement, I will have information on width, total length, area, high uh, number of chambers, number of passageways, so which eventually would lead me to uh, to, comp uh, to compute the in, in, uh, index of complexity. And then for human disturbances, so I've, I'm, I'm separating it into surface and subsurface levels. So for surface level, uh, for example, surface level, so I'm going to look into what are the types of uh, disturbances within one kilometer radius. I'll probably increase it to about to two kilometers and look to these indicators, like for, for surface level, non-forested habitat, urbanization, road size, and then for subsurface, so major maranto, you have mining, development, resource extraction, hunting, you know, waste, uh, tourism, and 
uh, graffiti and I'll do a scoring system based on the gravity of each indicator so zero is uh, no activity or no disturbance three is the, the, the maximum disturbance uh, to my, my, my advisors, uh, to my, uh, the committee I did present uh, submit a outline so there, were, there was a complete table on how to, to do the scoring of these disturbance types Right, so what are the cave attributes to be measured? So uh, for, for bats, I, I separated them into three major groups. Structural complexity, microclimate, and human disturbances like I, like I showed before. So that's total of 21 attributes all in all. And then for statistical analysis, uh, if you want me to uh, explain further, so Statistics is my strongest suit. So, I'll, of course, I'll do data normalization, log transform, or uh, arc cosine, or using Conwalker spirit of test. And I will do a principal component analysis. So, this type of analysis would actually will reduce the dimensionality of the data set. So, you have 21 variables, 21 parameters. So, using PCA, it can reduce to about four or five components, significant components, so medyo mas madali, it's going to be relatively easy to look into the in treatment of the data. And then uh, depending on the, 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 the nature of my data set, probably I'm going to use multivariate GLM, so using cave attributes as predictors, so those 21 or the components that are coming out of the PCA, and then species richness and abundance as response variables. So essentially, uh, what I'm trying to look here is to do what are the predictors that has a uh, significant contribution to species richness and abundance? <coughs> okay, and then I also use canonical correspondence analysis similar to, uh, sorry, to, to, to what uh, the paper in, 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 in China, a case in China did. So looking at the relationship and association strength of cave attributes with each bat species distribution. So actually this uh, will be the first time that will be done. So uh, for what will happen is that, let's say for a certain species like uh, Rhinolophus arcuatus, arcuate horseshoe bat, uh, with my dissertation, uh, we can possibly know what are the habitat requirements of that, 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 that cave bat. Does it prefer a large cave? Does it prefer a small cave? Does it prefer uh, to roost near the entrance? So you want a gun of information that has not yet been actually known in, 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 in Philippine mammals. Okay, so from, from my main uh, chapter two, it's similar to chapter one, except that it's arthropods. Uh, but of course, the, the, the survey methods or the sampling methods. Uh, I will sample arthropods in guano, of course, in non-guano substrate, so in between uh, uh, in the cave uh, uh, ground and in walls as well. So the ceiling would be very, very, very difficult, especially if, the, if there are some caves that would reach about 15 meter, meters in height. So uh, as of now, I, I lack the capability to, 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 to do a single rope technique. And I will use a uh, burlesque extractor. So I'll try to uh, construct a burlesque extractor, yeah, burlesque extractors in, in the field itself. And do pitfall trapping. And for the walls, uh, I'll uh, do time collection. So I'll just uh, take note of the time, how much, uh, uh, how much usually, let's say, two hours of collection and then stop, and then try to replicate that to other to other cases as well. And uh, the quantitative analysis is, uh, this, this, they're the same with the, the bats. So. But um, for key attributes, I am going to add back the right traits. So aside from the structural complexity, from the microclimate condition, and uh, the, the, the disturbances. So I'll include here species richness, abundance, one type, is it a fruit bat or an insect bat? Uh, fortunately, we don't have a some givers bat, so thank God for us. So that time bugs up in bat. Uh, of course, I also include guano depth, area, and microclimate. So, and the same statistical test as well. And then for, for, for arthropod order distribution, CCA. 
And then for main chapter 3, uh, so I'm going to look on in the community and profit structure of arthropods and looking into food web diagrams. So here I'll try to classify all the arthropods that I will capture into either taxa level uh, or, or uh, order or family. And uh, I'll also try to classify them according to adaptation mode, if it's proloxenic, meaning it is um, like for example bats that they do not complete their life cycle inside the cave. Proglophilic, uh, they can complete their life cycle in their cave, but also in similar habitat, like uh, dark, um, very, very dark um, rock crevices. And of course, proglobitic. And uh, also classify them into tropic gills. And then for, I'll also use bat derived base as predictor variables, and then the response variables would be these, uh, these part of what's in uh, operational levels now. Okay, so for food web, um, I have to admit uh, there's not a pro there's not a, a program, uh, statistical like uh, statistical program that can actually construct a food web. Mm -hmm. So for here, it's uh, what I say, what I call is mano mano, but depend uh, looking into what are the profit yields, known profit yields, like say for example, are they detritivores or consumers? and going into are they primary, secondary, or tertiary, or on a much deeper level, are they one of the critivores, predators, uh, parasitoids might be, bar be considered as predators. Uh, we also have facultative detritivores, so they're actually detritivores, but would often switch to predatory mode when needed. And same with facultative predators. And for dietary habits, literature search, uh, it will be mostly on available literature. I'll try as much as possible to, to, to conduct observations, especially on foraging. But for the most part, it will be literature search, uh, like the Harlem the, the Har and the uh, now. And um, I'll be relying heavily on Professor Encinares uh, and his thesis, that's right. <laughs> 2016, where they did a, um, the master's work in uh, case of fungus in man. Hmm. All right, so essentially para, uh, it's going to look like this. So this is another way of uh, constructing a, a food web. So you have the prices to primary consumer, primary to secondary consumer, and secondary to tertiary consumer. Okay, so my working hypothesis. So, so so after giving you my, my, my the, the literature search, uh, after giving you my objectives, my chapters, and the methodologies, what are my working hypotheses? So I'm going to apply uh, for patterns of species diversity. I'll try to look into also apply the species area to the relationship and the habitat diversity model. So actually, the habitat diversity model, so like Potter and McCoy, this was years after Arthur Wilson proposed that piece area relationship. So essentially, what this model tells you is the explanation <coughs> why there is high species richness in, in large areas. So it's about the diversity of habitat. So larger area would, they say larger area would house several habitat types of varying sizes and, and, uh, and, 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 and degrees. So I'll try to apply that by looking, of course, in my cave map data. So an um, equivalent to this, does it cor correspond with a high number of chambers, high number of passageways, the gradient, even the gradient for, for a microclimatic condition, is it, uh, does it play a role in, in promoting species diversity? So my hypothesis here would be that uh, both bat and arthropod diversity increases with increasing cave structural complexity. So the way of working hypothesis for that. And another uh, avenue that I will try to look into would be the assume disturbance itself as a factor in determining richness and abundance. So there are two possible hypotheses. First would be the disturbance and diversity inverse relationship, uh, wherein bats and arthropods are inversely related with disturbance. So uh, the highly disturbance the cave, the, the low diversity, the low values for bats and arthropods. 
and then and what we also have here is the intermediate high disturbance hypothesis where bat or arthropod diversity will be highest at caves with moderate amount of disturbance so you have this uh, I'm, 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 I like using the word spectrum so you have this on one end of the spectrum you have uh, disturbance intolerance species and on the opposite end you have the highly tolerant species and of course in the middle so you have this influx of both uh, assemblage from the highly intolerant and the highly tolerant thus you have higher species richness on at the middle or the moderately disturbed habitat and then of course work uh, I've shown you this slide before but uh, with this as my my um, uh, back on a sporting statement uh, I'll, my hypothesis would be bats being keystone species in case will have a direct or commensurate effect on arthropod community so of course we know the concept of keystone species or it can be applied in one species or it can be applied in a group of species but so on the other thing is for keystone for example you can have a bottom out trophic cascade. So you're all familiar with the term trophic cascade, wherein if you try to remove the bottom, the resource space, so you will have a cascading effect on the, subse uh, the subsequent um, trophic links or chains. So you have a subsequent, uh, uh, there will be a uh, decrease in the primary consumer and then so on and so forth. And that could, this kind of uh, bottoms up Cascade bottoms, so bottom up. It's reminiscent, it's highly reminiscent of what you see inside the cave. So of course, uh, bat one is <laughs> so highly reliant, it's, it's uh, directly proportional to the number of bats that is present. So if you try to remove bats, you'll also try, you're also removing the resource space. And what I want to look into is what would be the effect on the the, the resource chain or, uh, or the trophic chains. So in recap of my research question that I presented uh, a while ago, so my main question, what are the factors that influence species richness? So I'm trying to answer that with, of course, my methodological approach, that and arthropod survey, measurement of relevant cave attributes. For number, of course, specific question number one, so how do these cave attributes, structure, environmental conditions, biological traits, how do they influence arthropod species richness and abundance? So I'll try to look into habitat diversity model, the intermediate disturbance hypothesis, disturbance uh, diversity inverse relationship hypothesis as my working framework. And then for number two, uh, does bad species richness abundance affect or behave arthropod uh, structure? So I'm going to ask, try to answer that with uh, Bass's keystone species hypothesis. And is that a commensurate effect? So you want to question is that my question that so as a framework I'll be using the bottom of tropic cascade hypothesis. So okay, so Marami Salamat po. Uh,